Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's event. I am Anu Seppala of the Eindran Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, exciting debate. Um, our moderator tonight is Mickey Kaus, who is the author of The End of Equality, and also the author of a blog called Kaus Files on the Daily Caller. I also want to thank our generous donor who has provided funding for this and other similar events. Thank you very much for your support. And I'd like to tell all of you to stay after the debate since there will be a book signing of Jerome Brooks and Don Watkins's book, Free Market Revolution. And we also have a reception, uh, free appetizers and a cash bar. So please stay. And now, please join me in welcoming Mickey Kaus. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a choice of being uh, Jim Lair, Bob Schieffer, or Candy Crowley tonight. Do, do you have any preference? Yeah, okay. I, I'm, I, I think I'm not going to be Candy Crowley. Uh, I'm going to try to stay in the background. Uh, it's an important debate. It, this is not about uh, bayonets, big bird, or binders. It's about the, the, the essential issue at the heart of our political debates, which is the size and scope of government. Uh, you don't have to scratch very far beneath the surface to see that that's what the current 2012 election is about. What is government's proper role? Should it focus on protecting individual rights and free markets, or should it focus on promoting equality and solving society's problems? We have two very able debaters to take opposite sides of, of this issue tonight. Uh, Yaron Brook is executive editor of the Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand Institute. He is a columnist at Forbes.com, and his articles have been featured in major publications such as the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Investors Business Daily. He is the co-author of Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. And David Callahan is a co-founder of Demos, the New York-based public policy think tank. He's also been a friend of mine for years. Uh, he is now a senior fellow at Demos and editor of the Demos blog, PolicyShop.net. He's the author of eight books. Take that, you're on. Eight books. <laughs> and his many articles have been published in such venues as the New York Times, Washington Post, The Nation, and The American Prospect. And he's a regular commentator on Fox News and CNBC. So. If You'll come up, we can get started. I, um, the, the, the format is simple. We'll have a five minute uh, opening statement by each party. David will go first, then we'll have a brief rebuttal. Then I'll have four or five questions. Then we'll open it after about 45 minutes to the floor for questions. And after another 45 minutes, we will retire to sell books and drink. Uh, uh, David, you're first. Uh, great. Thank you, Mickey. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, it's always fun to debate with your Ron. And uh, thank you to whoever that donor is as well. This is, I think this is important stuff. Um, and thank you, Mickey, for, for doing this. Um, I've been a big fan of Mickey's work long before I met him. I was a big fan of his book, The End of Equality, which I would recommend everybody to check out. Um, so just to get started, I think that the... The real question here tonight, tonight is not what should government be doing, as if government were some autonomous entity with its own agenda and its own mind. The real question is what do we want government to do? What do we want to use it to do? This is a democracy, so government is us. It's um, a common tool that we use to get things done. It's a tool when we want to do things that um, we can't do as individuals, that the free market can't do, and that civil society and charity can't do. That's what government is as I see it. Um, and in my mind, there's a lot of stuff that government needs to do right now. In fact, I think government should be doing a lot more than it is doing, not less to confront the, the challenges we face as a society, and also to confront global economic competitors like China and Germany 
that very much believe in strong government and a strong state. So let me talk about a, a few big roles of government to, to get things going here. Um, first, government has a role to play in protecting us from bad things. And I know that Yaron and I uh, agree on some of the protections that government should provide, like protection from being killed by a terrorist or uh, mugged by a street criminal or defrauded by somebody like Bernie Madoff. Yaron and I would agree on that. Um, but I take a more expansive view of, of what government should protect us from than Yaron does. For example, uh, I also want government to, to protect us from irresponsible corporations, uh, which statistically, by the way, are, are a lot more dangerous to Americans than, than terrorists. Uh, personally, I don't care whether my four-year-old son um, dies in an Al-Qaeda attack or dies from a, a contaminated hamburger because somebody at the, some meatpacking plant cut corners, he's still dead and I want government to, to, to protect my son in either scenario, which is why, for example, I support the, the FDA, uh, just like I support the CIA. Also, uh, I want government to protect people from, from economic harm. So if, if a bunch of uh, bankers and traders uh, on Wall Street are turning the place into a casino and putting the whole US economy at risk, uh, I want my government to step in and say, hey, that is not okay. Uh, I wish they had done that before the 2008 crisis. Uh, I want government to be on its toes next time, which is why I support this Dodd-Frank Act and want to see a, a tougher SEC. Also, when economic disasters do occur, I want government to help the victims, just like we expect government to help the victims of natural disasters. Uh, even with better regulation, capitalism will, uh, it's always going to be prone to instability. There's always going to be booms and busts. There's always going to be people who are, who are caught up in those and suffer. If you want or ordinary people to support this market system, government needs to be there for them when the system goes haywire. That's why I support a strong safety net. Uh, food stamps, unemployment insurance, welfare. It's why I think we should have a, a public government jobs program today like we did in the 1930s. Uh, I would add that, that even when government is not going off the rails, uh, it can be pretty, uh, sorry, even when capitalism is not going off the rails, it can be pretty harsh. Capitalism is, is a fantastic system for creating wealth and, and all sorts of innovation, uh, but it's not so great at, at spreading that wealth around. And there's a lot of things that the market doesn't do so well, like uh, providing insurance, health insurance for everybody, or retirement security, or ensuring that workers get a fair uh, slice of the wealth that they are creating, or ensuring that every kid has equal opportunity uh, through education, which is why I support things like Social Security and Medicare, and why I support the new health care law passed by Congress, uh, and why I want government to, to help protect uh, workers who try to form unions. More broadly, I believe that we need to use government as this tool of democracy to ensure that the economy works for everyone. Market actors need to be accountable to us, not to nobody, to us. And that is one of the things that, that one of the main things that government can do. Okay, no, we're, we're about okay. so uh, I have some more thoughts. We'll add them as we we'll, go along. We'll get to them, I'm sure. <laughs> so as you can imagine, as David knows, while I agree with the first three things I think he said, I don't agree with any of the rest. Um, for the last 200 years, we've been running a, an experiment, a kind of a, a social political experiment on what kind of systems deliver the goods and what kind of political systems do not. Uh, we've tried pretty close to pure capitalism, not quite there, but, but close, uh, both in this country and other places around the world. We've tried pure communism and we've tried all kinds of varieties in between. And the empirical evidence, in my view, is you know, 
incontroversial, it's, it's you know, very clear. The more economic freedom you provide, the more protection of property rights, but that's it, leaving the rest of the market alone. The greater the wealth created, the better off the poor are, the greater the standard of living of the average person in society is. I don't think, I think the empirical data on that for the last 200 years is in. Uh, there's not that much question uh, about that. Uh, a lot of what David talked about, you know, the market doesn't provide insurance, is, is just not true. Free markets, true free markets, provide incredible options in terms of insurance. The problem is that we face today, particularly when trying to defend free markets in America today, is that we have no markets. We have varying industries that have varying levels of government control. Some have just a little bit of gun control. They're not that many anymore, but let's say the technology industry. And some have massive quantities of government control, healthcare, financial industry, and guess what? That's where the real problems are. It's, and there's a direct correlation, even within the United States today, of the same experiment we've been running across 200 years. The more freedom you allow an industry, the greater its success, the less fraud there is, the less problems there are, the less crises there are. And the more you regulate, the more you control, the more problems, the more crises, the more volatility, the more fraud there is. So in terms of performance, in terms of actual generating standard of living, I don't think there's any question that markets work, markets are better, and a small limited government is, is where we need to be. The question then becomes, what is, what is the principle that should limit government? And I think the founders of this country, and really the Enlightenment generally, had the right idea. The purpose of government is not to provide for us. The purpose of government is not to redistribute, it's not to control, it's not to regulate, it's not to make our life good or bad. The purpose of government is to protect us. The purpose of government is to protect our individual rights. It's in our Declaration of Independence. We each have an inalienable right to our own life our own liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. Not the achievement of happiness, but the pursuit of happiness. Now, whether the founders understood this consistently or didn't understand this consistently is not important. What's important is the truth of that principle. You own your own life. Your life is yours to do as you please. And the only barrier, the only thing that can interfere with you pursuing your values, pursuing your choices, pursuing the happiness that you want is force. It's coercion. The government's job, the only job of government, is to protect you from your neighbor coercing you into having to do something you do not want to do. It's to protect you from the thieves and the crooks and the Madoffs and the terrorists. So if the government is there to protect you from coercion, then the last thing you want the government to be is an agent of coercion. And all the programs that David talks about and all the programs that we have today, the programs that have been instituted really over the last hundred or so years, are all coercive programs. They all involve controlling your life. They all involve telling what you what you can and cannot do. They all involve taking some of your money and giving it to somebody else or telling you what profession you can and cannot enter or telling you what kind of bank loan you should and shouldn't get, what kind of home you should and shouldn't own. Government is, today, coercion. And it's not using coercion in the sense of the founders, in a sense of individual rights, in a sense of protecting you. It's initiating that coercion. It's initiating force. It has become the thief, the robber, the, the, all those things that were supposed to protect us from. Government today has become. I'd like to shrink government, not in so much in terms of size, but in terms of purpose to protecting our individual rights and doing nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have a, a short rebuttal period, two or three minutes for each party. Yeah, I would just like to point out that the free market and the economy also coerces people and provides them with, with choices that makes them do things that they don't want to do. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you have a good middle class job working at an auto plant uh, and the plant you know, you get benefits and you have enough to live that American dream, 
but then the plant is closed down and the jobs are shipped overseas because of globalization, which is something that you have no control over. So there you are, you know, off in your, your Midwestern city, and for various reasons, you have roots in the community, you can't really move. So you take, but you need a job. So you go and you get a job at, at a retail store like Target, and you get paid uh, $10 an hour. But there's no benefits, there's no, there's no health insurance. You don't have any, actually, you don't have much choice. You have to take that job to survive. This is the, the nature of our economic system. Maybe, okay, maybe you can move, perhaps you can move someplace else, but you know, you're still gonna be uh, somebody who has limited skills uh, in this economy because you used to be an auto worker. It, it, you have very limited freedom in that situation. And so I think that it is a legitimate role for government to step in and say, look, you employer, you retail employer, you know, you should, provide a certain level of, of wages. I think it's legitimate for government to step in and subsidize those wages with the earned income tax credit. I think it's legitimate for government to say, uh, we're gonna give health insurance for your children. I think it's legitimate for government to say, we're gonna give you money to go back to school to get some new skills. I think it's legitimate for government to make sure you have health insurance because if government doesn't do all those things, you are at the total mercy of of the employers in your area to survive. And that, to, in my mind, is just as much a form of coercion as anything that Yaron talked about, and in terms of the most deadly form of, of coercion. I mean, look, there's numerous examples where corporations cut corners and people die. Look at the coal disaster, in the Massey coal disaster in West Virginia. A couple dozen workers died because, as it turned out, that company was not uh, enforcing the, the, the safety standards at the coal mine. So people die. <laughs> when corporations are irresponsible, people can die just as much as when, uh, you know, government does something or when military force is involved. So that is a massive equivocation on what coercion means. Coercion means force. It means something. It's not whatever you want it to mean. And it that doesn't mean whatever happens to you that you don't like. Force means force. It means a gun, it means a punch, it means grabbing you, it means defrauding you. Co you don't have a right to somebody else's stuff. You don't have a right to a job, and the employer doesn't have a right to employ you. That is a contract. It is a mutually agreeable contract, and the fact is the employee can leave. <clears throat> the employees can all leave, and leave the employer without any, you know, any, anybody to, do, to work on the plant or whatever. The, this is a voluntary transaction. It's not coercion. Uh, David talks a lot about us, about government, government doing this, government doing that. But he said before, which I agree with, government is not some entity over there. Government is us, and indeed government is us. So when government is providing somebody with health care, what does that mean? I mean, government is pulling out a gun, forcing some of us to pay for somebody else's health care. It's coercing some of us to supply somebody else's health care. Now, if you need health care, if your child is sick and needs health care, you can come and ask me for it, but you have no right, no moral right, and you should not have a legal right to pull a gun out and force me to provide your child with health care. By going through the government, all you're doing is using a middleman to get my money. It's still theft. It's still theft. There's no difference between you coming up to me and saying, I want your money, or you convincing 51% of the population to come and take my money. So when we talk about government, we're talking about people. We're talking about people coercing other people to do what government, what a majority wants. And look, majorities, you know, majorities don't have a right to use coercion any more than individuals have a right to use coercion. You know, my favorite story here uh, is, is the story of Socrates. We understand in, in this country somehow, unfor unfortunately we're losing this as well, that we have freedom of speech. But in Athens, they didn't have freedom of speech, they had democracy. So when Socrates was corrupting the youth of the town, right, they all got together and voted. And they voted to kill him, 51%, who knows what the vote was, but it was a majority. And Socrates dies. That's what happens to a rights. You know, there's no difference between freedom of speech and property rights. And, and property rights don't exist in this country. If your neighbors want to turn your house into a tennis 
into a tennis court, they can do it as long as they vote on it. Right? That's what kilo means, the kilo decision means. So we have no rights. You have no ownership of your own life. You have no ownership of your own choices. Now you are a, you know, a piece in the puzzle that the majority gets to move around. And that's what government has come to mean in this country. It has come to mean the majority violating the rights of the minority. And of course, the smallest minority is the individual. Uh, let's talk a bit about uh, income inequality. It's a very hot issue. By most measures, inequality has been growing. Uh, uh, it's sort of a two-part question. Do you think the natural course of capitalism, of a free capitalism, is toward more money equality or less money equality, and why should it not be toward more inequality? Uh, second, is there some, lo uh, to Iran, is there some level of inequality if, if capitalism takes that natural course, which would be intolerable to you? Is it Rio de Janeiro, where some people are living in slums and other people are living on the hill in mansions? Is there some level at which you would be offended? And David, if capitalism is getting more unequal through large global trends, there was an article in the New York Times just today saying that, what can you possibly do to correct it? Uh, who wants to go first? Want to go first? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll go first. Um, Next time you'll go first. Okay. So um, I think that a certain level of inequality is a good thing and necessary to make capitalism work, right? If we all got paid the same amount of money to do whatever we were doing, no matter how hard we worked, that would be bad, right? There would be no incentives to work harder. So I think that you, you want the people who are really successful to get paid more, and I'm fine if they get paid a lot more. I don't have any problem that you know, Bill Gates is a billionaire because he invented some, some really great things. I, I, I think that, that uh, disparate rewards are a great motivator, and inequality is, is good in, in that way. But I think the problem is is that we have too much inequality today for sort of a lot of structural economic reasons because of technology, because of globalization, and also we have a lot of inequality because of public policy that has favored the, the wealthy with tax breaks and with all sorts of other kinds of, kinds of things. And um, in my mind, that's not okay. The, the, the America that, that I like, that, that resonates with me is, more like the, the early uh, decades of the post-war era, when yeah, the rich, there were rich people for sure, but, the, but there was growth and everybody was growing together, right? The, the, working, the working class people, their incomes were rising, the CEOs, their incomes were rising, and it was a period of really shared prosperity. And you know, when, w just the fact that you had some yacht, yachts up there didn't bug people because everybody was getting, was getting wealthier together. And that has not been the story in America in the last 25 years where you know, you've really seen stagnant incomes for, for people in the middle and the people at the bottom and you've seen astronomical gains by the people at the top. That's not shared economic growth. And I think a big goal of public policy and what we should do using government together is to try to get an economy where all, all boats are rising at the same time, not just the yachts going into the stratosphere while the dinghies sink. So I have no opinion about inequality. Um, it is in freedom, in a truly free state, it will be what it will be. Um, I don't think we have a <coughs> stake in it. Now, if you're asking, and, and I, I don't want to get into a discussion here about whether inequality is growing or not. I mean, I think there's, I think it's a mixed story, and I think the data is is not, is not clear cut uh, of what's been but, happening. But in you don't care. No, I care about what happens today, because what's happening today is not freedom. It's not capitalism. I care that there's massive redistribution of wealth. I care that the government is trying to fix a so-called problem that I don't think ever existed. I find it interesting that, that David wants to go back to the 50s. Let's remember, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no war in poverty, no welfare, uh, and poverty was actually declining, not like it has been in the last 30 years, f basically flat. What I care, if I, had to, you know, if I had to say, what do I care in terms of wealth, right? I care that we're getting wealthier. I care that the standard of living is rising. I care that the poor are better off. And indeed, I think under capitalism, the poor are much better off than they are under any other system. But relatively speaking, why should I care how rich my neighbor is as long as I'm doing better? 
Uh, why, should, why should the poor care if somebody's a billionaire, if they're better off because he's a billionaire? Which I think is the case almost always. So the case of Rio de Janeiro is not a good case because it's not free. It's not capitalism. It's, it's a heavy, you know, heavy cronyism. Uh, uh, you know, Brazil, Argentina, South America is heavily influenced by cronyism. And we're moving to that system today in the United States. We're becoming a crony society where some people are getting rich, not because they're creating stuff, but because they have good friends in Washington. So I want to move us away from a system where some elite, some philosopher king gets to decide what the right level of inequality is. Or oh, Bill Gates did good, so we'll let him keep his money, but you didn't do so good, so I'm going to move your money in. And I like Wall Street today because they've contributed to my campaign, so they get goodies, and I don't like somebody else, so I'm going to restrict their goodies. I want politicians, I want the majority, I want us to back off and let individuals work and make the best living they can make. And how that turns out, I actually, I'll tell you how I believe it'll turn out. I think it'll, it'll, there'll be dramatic inequality between the very rich and the poor, but I think the poor will be better off than they will be anywhere else on the planet and ever have been in human history. And I think that everybody's better off. The difference between the, rich, the very rich and the very poor, is that bigger or smaller? I suspect it's actually less than it is today in true freedom, because I, I believe that gap is exacerbated by government. I think all the programs that try to minimize that gap actually are increasing it, because they distort the allocation of wealth. But I don't know, and again, I don't care. I just care about being free, each one of you, to be able to maximize your pursuit of happiness <coughs> and your ability to make money. Let me just end on this note. I don't think it's all about money. Since when is it about money? It shouldn't be about money. I mean, a lot of us do stuff because we love it, not because it makes us a lot of money. And, you know, people choose to be teachers, not for the money. They choose to be teachers because they love teaching. And it's about happiness. Is there happiness inequality? Sure. And they always will be. But that's because people make different choices and they'll always be, that's the real gap that's interesting. We want people to be happier. We want to leave them free to be able to be happier. Did you want to rebut? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, one of the big things that's happened in this country is that people who only have a high school diploma, um, which is a pretty large slice of the, of the working population, have just gotten creamed by this economy. In the last 30 years, people in that group have seen their earnings go down by a, as much as 40%. I mean, significant drop in earnings for, because it used to be that you could come out of high school and get a job working at an auto plant and have a, a, or some other manufacturing plant and have a middle class mm -hmm. life. Now, if you don't have a college degree, you're stuck working at Walmart with no benefits, no, uh, uh, you know, no, no retirement package, no, noth no nothing. And that, when I think of inequality, I think of that. I think of that, that you know, only a quarter of the adult U.S. population has a, a, a BA or, or an AB. So you have a huge number of people who are getting creamed in this, this, this economy. And in my mind, that's the face of inequality in this country. It's the low-wage worker with very few opportunities who's stuck in this economy, who has to take whatever job that they can, Meanwhile, you have a, 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 you know, the top 1% that's doing astronomically well. I don't have anything against the top 1%, but I don't think it's okay to have prosperity so uh, concentrated and so poorly shared in this society. That is not an economy that's working for everybody. I want to use government and our democracy to make it work better for everybody. I mean, otherwise, why have an economy if it doesn't work for everybody? It should work for all of us. So I'll agree with David. Uh, we have an economy that is really bad for the ambitious poor, for those people who want to do better, who, who, who maybe only have a high school degree or maybe haven't even finished high school degrees. The problem is that all the government programs that you know, David would like to institute and have been instituted, right? We've had a war on poverty for, since the 1960s, for 50 years, right? They make things worse, not better. They, the biggest victims of these programs are the ambitious poor. All the regulations on starting a business, the fact that in California you need a license to shampoo hair, right? Those don't help anybody except the people who've been shampooing hair for 20 years. But who are they hurting? They're hurting the new, the, you know, the person who wants to enter the industry who, who, who just has a high school degree and can't make a living now because they have to go pay somebody to get certified to shampoo hair after all. 
And, and the, you know, that's a tiny little example. There are millions of these regulations and controls that make it expensive for the poor to enter the, to enter the workforce. You know, my favorite is minimum wage. Minimum wage that causes unemployment among the people who can least afford to be unemployed. It causes unemployment among teenagers in the inner cities who, you know what? They don't produce nine bucks an hour. In California, you have to, I guess in some place, you have to go up to 10, 10 and a half bucks an hour. They don't produce that much. Nobody can afford to hire them at nine bucks an hour. But nobody can legally hire them for six bucks an hour, which they would if there wasn't a minimum wage. So these kids will never have a job. Because if you start at six, then you learn the skills, and you get to eight, and then you get to 20, and maybe one day you get to 40, and maybe you'll run a whole network of McDonald's store one day. But they, if you never start, you never get there. And what we're denying people through a lot of these schemes is the ability to start. So I agree. I care about the poor. I care about those kids who, who, who got high school degrees. And I, you know, we can talk about education maybe in a separate question. You know, the education is not preparing them for, for, for a real workforce. But I care about those people. The problem is that government is the problem. Government is what is destroying those jobs. The reason jobs are leaving the United States is it's become prohibitively expensive to do business in the US. Because of all the nonsense, governors weaned up on companies in order to so-called protect the workers, but indeed is destroying workers, the workers in the United States. Um, I'd like to quickly bring up the subject of immigration, because it's a hot issue in the campaign. And, and I understand there's a split on, among libertarians on immigration. Some people, I think Ron Paul might have been one of them, have been fairly uh, tough on border control, analogizing the country to a piece of private property, and you can keep out outsiders, other, pe other people. I, I had a conversation with Vin Weber at the Republican Convention. He said, I don't see how you can be for free movement of goods and not be for free movement of people, which I didn't understand at all. But um, uh, I I which, which side of this debate are you on? And it, you'd be, you know, if everybody from in Latin America who wants to move here has the right to move here, people won't be paying $6 an hour. They'll be paying $1 an hour, 50 cents an hour. Are you happy with that? Well, if people are being paid $1 an hour, then the goods are going to be a lot more dramatically cheaper. We see that with Walmart in China, right? And therefore, the standard of living won't necessarily drop. It'll just mean that you'll have declining prices, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. So um, I think the whole idea of bringing in immigrants lowers the standard of living in a country. It, it, there's just no evidence of this. There's no evidence of this in the United States in the 19th century when we absorbed millions and millions of immigrants into this country and we created many more jobs than we had people and the standard of living of everybody in the country rose. Uh, there's no evidence of this in, in Israel which absorbed millions of immigrants into a very, very poor country which had nothing in a tiny little space. Everybody's doing better off today as a consequence. Uh, immigration per se is not destructive economically, it is a plus economically. The problem I see with immigration today into the United States is all the goodies that the government is handing out. So if we say, we're gonna redistribute wealth and the people who, who, who are making stuff and give it to whoever wants it, right? And by the way, we're opening our borders so you can come and get it, then that is incredibly destructive. It's, it's, it's providing healthcare services to anybody who wants them. It's providing public education to anybody who walks across the border. It's providing welfare to anybody who crosses the border. It's those things that make immigration a net negative today, you know, to the extent that a negative. But I think the real issue with immigration, and I think a winning issue for the Republicans if they ever picked it up, but of course they won't, is, is, to, is to maximize legal immigration, is to come up with better schemes for legal immigration. It's to, and we, we have huge shortages of labor in this country. Uh, you know, we, we, if you go to Silicon Valley, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of jobs that are unfilled there because we don't produce enough engineers in the United States today. And we don't allow enough engineers to come into the country. And it, when they come here to study, right, 75% of all graduate students in uh, sciences and engineering uh, are foreigners, 75% are masters and PhDs, right, are foreigners. And what do we do when they graduate? We kick them out. So at the very least, staple a visa, give them, give them a green card when they come in, right? So if we're educating them, again, a taxpayer's expense. Um, so my problem is the welfare state. Uh, without the welfare state, I'd, I'd be very sympathetic to uh, significantly greater immigration uh, that we have today. David. Um, I think that Iran and I don't disagree that much on this issue. I'm all for letting in more engineers and more 
uh, people who can who can add value to this economy. I think that the the, the lower skilled immigrants have added a tremendous amount of, of value to this to this economy as well. Um, I think, though, that coming back to the subject of the the, the role of, of government, that there's a very important role for government to play in ensuring that the changing demographics in this country become a real uh, plus in the long term. I mean, if you look ahead, 50% of this country is going to be non-white in uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, if you look at the schools, you know, if you look at if you look at schools right now, if you look at uh, elementary schools, they're already half kids of color. A lot of them are Latino uh, and children of immigrants. And uh, if we don't invest in those people, invest in their skills, invest in their human capital, invest in the kind of infrastructure needed to, to, to create prosperity, uh, we're going to have big problems long term. And what one of the things that I'm afraid of is you have a future in which the kind of, uh, you know, boomers are, are pulling up the ladder behind them and not making the investments to grow tomorrow's middle class. So one of the things we've done at Demos is really take a, a big, hard look at who's going to be in tomorrow's chain, more diverse middle class, and how do we ensure that those people can be really productive citizens and help grow this economy and, and create wealth. And government has a big role to play there. One uh, quick statement. Uh, sure. In the 19th century, when we absorbed the largest immigration in human history as a percentage of the existing population, right, there were no government programs, and they did quite well. We're all, you know. Well, right after that big immigration surge, Yaron, we, we created the federal uh, income tax. We, we created after. a whole, Way we started. After. We after started. they'd already achieved middle class, and now, you know, now wow. they, could, they could achieve the status of, okay, Let's take that European philosophy we immigrated uh, here with and, and uh, start undercutting what made this country great. Well, I'm uh, notice that at the same time as we created the income tax, we limited immigration. Well, it's the I, same year, right? The same laws. That that, that period between 1913 and 1917 is when we limited immigration. We stopped immigration. This is one of the great tragedies of, of European Jewry, at least. We instituted income tax, and we started the path towards state tax. You know, I'm, I'm from Westchester County, and, which is right outside of New York City. And if you go to a lot of uh, major uh, suburban areas around big cities, what you find are like the third or fourth generation descendants of immigrants. You know, the Italians and the Eastern Europeans, and they, 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 they moved to the, they made, made good, they moved to the suburbs. They did all of the things they did with a great deal of government help. The GI Bill was the biggest investment in building the middle class, the biggest social benefit bill we've ever had in this country. The, the uh, subsidies to, for, the, for the infrastructure, the roads that, that led into the suburbs, the, the mortgage interest deduction that helped, and all the cheap subsidized government loans that helped create that, uh, that home ownership, which became the foundation of wealth. The public universities, where all the immigrants went or sent their kids, which allowed them to get a first-rate education. I mean, any place you look, if you look at the wealthy immigrants who, who, who succeed or live in these suburban areas, government was there for them again and again through the middle of the 20th century. Now, we've been attacking and cutting a lot of those programs that help that big immigration surge succeed and join the middle class. That is wrong. Uh, I had one candy crawling moment with your on. I'm gonna, I, let me have one with you. Do you really <laughs> think that unlimited immigration would not, of unskilled immigrants would not drive down the wages of unskilled Americans, the very people who've done the worst through in the, in the changes of the past few decades with trade and technology, which as you said, yeah. have already lowered their wage by 40%. I, I think you raise a, a good point. I do not favor unlimited immigration. I think there needs to be a balance. We need to absorb the, the you know, we, there, needs, there is a process of absorption for sure. Um, Let's take up the topic of education, since you suggested it. Uh, I throw it open. What should the government's role in terms of getting people educated be? Uh, I guess, whose turn uh, is it? Why don't you run? Run? Okay. He loves it. Because um, <laughs> he knows my answer. I'm uh, none. Zero. Zilch. Um, government should have no involvement in education. Uh, we have government education today. It's a disaster. It's a disaster at every level. I know David's going to say, in rich neighborhoods, the public schools are great. They're excellent. It's the problem is the poor neighborhood. Yes, the problem is the poor neighborhood, because the whole process being politicized, and you don't get the real competition for value. What you get is, 
you know, who cares about those neighborhoods? That's democracy. That's how politics work. It's awful. That's why we shouldn't have it. Uh, and the schools in the rich neighborhoods are good by what standard? By the standard of the poor neighborhood. Yes, they're better. Um, I would like to see real competition, real innovation, real brain power being brought to education. I'd like to see the profit motive in education. I'd like to see people make the kind of bucks they make on these iPhones on building schools. I'd like to see the Steve Jobses of the world not only thinking about how to create a, 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 a career in technology, but how to create a career building great schools that provide great products that they can then market to the customers who are not unions, who are not bureaucrats, but who are the parents and the kids who need to get educated. So I'd like to see the kind of innovation, you know, we spend, I don't know how much time we, we have really, really in brain power. We have really, really smart people trying to figure out how to make this slightly better. We saw uh, an iPad mini yesterday, right? And I'm gonna buy one, because I love iPad, right? I'm gonna get one. <laughs> but imagine bringing that brain power, bringing that innovative spirit, bringing that profit motive, greed call it, right? That incentive to make money into the field of education and making great products over there. I don't think, I, I think our best public schools today would pale in comparison. And yes, private schools today are not that better than public schools because you can't compete with a government monopoly that's as large and as dominant as it is today. There's no real marketplace for education. Let's create a real marketplace for education. Uh, that would be fun to watch. That, that would really, that could be exciting. I like the idea of more uh, innovation and competition in this sector. I do agree with you that it's not been as, as dynamic as it, as it could be. And, and I think that actually there's a lot of uh, societal agreement around that. And there's a lot happening, including you know, the charter school movement, the, you know, President Obama's Race to the Top initiative, which has uh, a lot, it's trying to foster a lot of in innovation and all of that. But here's the thing. Um, Ultimately, I have a, I have a son who, who, who goes to public schools, and if I didn't, if I were left alone, just if our family were left alone to pay for his education without the help of older generations who'd already been educated themselves, we would not be able to afford it. The only way that education is affordable for, 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 for young families is through this social compact, whereby the people who've already who, who have already educated their, their kids, or in some cases don't have kids, kick in to help educate the people who have school-aged kids. That's the way this, the, it works. If you, if you took that away, if you took away that, that, that basic kind of reciprocity and, and social compact, nobody would be able to afford uh, to educate their kids except for the wealthy. And that's why we invented public schools. That's why we have public schools supported by, by, by taxation. Um, so that's a big and central role for government. Can it be more dynamic? Yes. Uh, and then, of course, there's the whole importance of, of education in terms of building human capital to compete. Look at China, look at India, look at our competitors. They are, are, are graduating so many engineers and so many scientists of all, of all different kinds. We have to build human capital too to compete in this globalized era and we need uh, to, to government to play a role in helping us do that, particularly through our public universities, which have historically been these amazing incubators of scientific breakthroughs and other kinds of economic uh, forward steps. And we've been defunding the public universities. How can we be talking about the rise of China and the rise of India even as we defund our public universities and, and undermine the human capital production that we need to compete? That makes no sense to me and will make us poorer in the long run. Can I, can we continue in this? Yeah, just one more back and forth. Sure. Okay. Um, cost, uh, I really recommend you guys look at the work of a guy named James Tooley, uh, who's, a, who's a British academic who's written extensively about uh, private schools in the poorest slums in uh, Nigeria and in, uh, in India. And the quality of education in those slums, in those private schools, I mean, it, it, it is truly amazing. He's actually putting his money where his work is, and he's actually creating a network of private schools in those countries to capitalize on the fact that parents want their kids to get a great education, and they find the money. 
one less iPod. Uh, you know, we can get today mortgages to buy homes that we can't afford, right? Because you can't afford to actually pay down in cash. So you get something. Could we get loans to, I mean, lots of mechanisms, the private market would come up to make education affordable. And, and what about those poor kids who, who won't be able to afford it? Well, we'd set up scholarship funds. I mean, there, there will be, I, I can almost guarantee that in a free market of education, there won't be a child who goes uneducated and in a much better educational system than we have today. Uh, government corrupts these things. By the way, uh, public education was not created in order to make us all more enlightened. Public education was created the uh, first time in Bismarck's Germany and was imported into the United States in order to create workers in the factory who did what they were told. It worked very well in Germany, by the way. We saw the results uh, 100 years later. Uh, but that was, the, that was the motivation, that was the ideology that drove public education and bringing it into the United States. And lastly, China. Um, I don't know how much exposure you've had to Chinese uh, graduates from the Chinese public schools, but let's hope that American schools never, ever, ever uh, deteriorate to that level. Uh, they are not taught to think, they are taught to what, memorize. Uh, it, there's no, it's not an accident that the Chinese send their smartest kids here. Uh, we still have, in spite of all our problems, we still have a much better educational system. Uh, and the issue here is not competition between countries. The issue is here is what as we individuals, how do we as individuals make the most of our lives? How do we live as individuals the best lives that we can be? And I think that we get, we're going to live better lives if we could get our education not from a government bureaucracy, but from a, a, a private school system that somewhat is customized to our parents' preferences. There'll be all kinds of schools. Uh, and uh, it would be much more individuated than the regimentation that exists today in our schools and certainly in China. Just quickly, there's a, a story about a new private school started in Manhattan by a group of parents who thought it was so outrageous that private school was so expensive. And that they, so they banded together to start their own private school, you know, which would be much less expensive. And what they found is that it still cost $30,000. Uh, they still had to charge $30,000 for tuition. Mind you, this is New York City. But they still had to charge $30,000 for students. Uh, and even then, they weren't meeting their costs. Even then, they weren't breaking even. It's a very expensive to educate kids, especially if you want to educate them really well. And that's why private schools are so expensive. And everybody knows that private schools still have to raise money from their alums and to do all that. And Yaron said, oh, in a free market, perfect free market system, everybody will get education. Well, we have a perfect, not a perfect, but we have largely a free market system when it, when it comes to higher education. There's no compulsory, edu no compulsory college education. A lot of people who want to go to college, even with all those loans and even with all the public universities, can't and can't afford it and drop out. We have documented this in, in our studies. There's so many people who drop out of college because they can't afford it. And those are people who are not going to be able to contribute as much as they might have to society. Uh, I want one more round of questions and then we'll open up to, for questions from, from the audience. 